Okay, everyone, it's Gordon Einstein, your resident uh, crypto attorney here in Dubai. And I have a great pleasure today to introduce a friend of mine for a very long time. We're going to try to figure out how long. Brad Yasser. Brad, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Gordon. How are you? I I'm thrilled. How, how long have we known each other? That's a tough one. A decade and a half. Oh, gosh. Okay, that's scary. Um, I, th I think it's more like a decade because, well, and actually, it's, you and I started working on a, an ICO, which we'll not name, uh, maybe a decade ago. And I knew you a couple years before then, but it, it's been a while. Um, so yes. you're, you're a fascinating person. You've been involved in uh, Reg A capital raises. You've been involved in crypto and blockchain. You're very entrepreneurial. You're working on a lot of things. I, th I think we're going to have a wide ranging conversation. And I'm especially excited because you seem to be coming more and more frequently to Dubai and maybe, you know, setting up one of your flags or tents or poles here also, and which is a great, great topic to cover. So just, just for the audience who doesn't know me as well as I know you, give, give me your background. Give me, give me the story of Brad. Okay. I'll do, I'll do a quick one. Um, I um, love technology. I love building stuff that started at a very early age. I um, started programming really early then, uh, um, sold software and and, uh, and and that started a lifelong journey with uh, with the entrepreneurship and, and computers for me, software and hardware. Let me, um, let me I actually, I didn't know that, so I'll interrupt when I learned something new. What, what kind of software did you sell? Um, bookkeeping. Interesting. And was this, you're, you're originally from Turkey? Yes. And were you doing this in Turkey or in the U.S. or where were you at the time? I, I was in Turkey. Interesting. Okay, and we'll talk about your transition also. Okay, so you got you got exposed to technology. You loved it. Uh, what, what were you programming in back in the day? Uh, basic. I remember that. But, but I also did Fortran, Pascal, COBOL, um, low-level machine language on Motorola, 68,000 chips and nice. a couple others. C. Very good. Amazing. Um, keep going. Yeah. And, and then um, I, uh, I realized that uh, I can have all the scientific technical knowledge, but if I don't know how to do business, um, it's not going to go anywhere. So I studied business and um, moved to U.S., started another um, e-commerce implementation business uh, after after I got my uh, degrees and uh, that didn't go well. And uh, we pivoted that to a big data company that did some customer um, behavior predictions. That was very successful, mm -hmm. exited that company um, and then uh, tried to figure out what I want to do next, uh, did a bunch of consulting, um, always stuck to keeping up with leading edge technology just because it's a passion, it's not work related. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, 2009 got involved with Bitcoin, um, fell in love with it, uh, got really excited about the uh, opportunity that it uh, you represented. Might correctly. You got involved with Bitcoin the year the paper came out? Um, the paper came out in 2008. 2008. Right. I right, right. came out uh, November, December of 2009, and the first transactions were done January 2009. So maybe yes. a year, year or so into it. That, that, what? That's amazingly early. What? What brought it to your attention? Um, pure luck. A friend of mine, he was the CTO of a startup, sent me uh, three files to compile, said, Brad, compile these, you're going to love it. And I thought he's trying to take care of my, uh, uh, take over my systems. So I created a virtual contained environment, compiled them. Uh, it was a full Bitcoin node, a wallet and a miner, uh, basically. So I started uh, trying to figure out what it is. I mean, I'm probably one of the, a few people who compiled a Bitcoin node without reading the Bitcoin white paper first. I, I had no clue what it was. I just, you, you know, friends send you a gag gift. You, of course, comply and go with it to see what it does. And it turned out to be Bitcoin. 
in my case. That's amazing. And interesting. And then did you maintain the interest in it going forward or was there, was there ever a lapse or did you just take you and change your life? Um, no, I, I maintained it uh, at a casual um, pedestrian kind of level. Didn't uh, really get into the, the code or anything like that. I tried it out, thought it was interesting, put a couple 286 PCs to mine it because you could mine 50 Bitcoin a day uh, those days on a 286 discarded PC that you couldn't do anything else with. So um, did, did a little bit of that um, in 11, 12, um, ran a couple ideas by friends of mine, uh, investors, because I thought the uh, command line interface was not really conducive to Bitcoin's um, growth and adoption. and Sure. There wasn't a lot of interest. Um, then, um, you know, got excited about Litecoin because it sounded like it was going to be a faster, better version. Mm -hmm. Colored coins, you you name it, Ethereum, just kept uh, going with it. And, and, you know, when EVM came, I was blown away because I tried uh, developing on Bitcoin blockchain and it, was not conducive to any kind of serious programming because by design, it's not designed to be programmable. Uh, whereas with Ethereum, it became very clear that you can have a uh, computational layer on top of the blockchain. And Sure. I mean, that, that's, 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 sort of the, we are. that's the point of it, yes? Um, yeah. So, but you were experimenting with Bitcoin scripting at the time? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so we're, there's a big gap here because we'll get to Ankyfy in a second. But but what was your rest of your journey? So you know, with Ethereum and post Ethereum, how did you get into? We'll, we'll we'll talk about what you're doing now in a moment. But how did what was your road right up to that? Let's include the Reg A plus stuff also because I think that's fascinating. Yes, so the Reg A plus stuff was. Um... I started investing uh, about two decades ago and I would get the same three questions uh, all the time. It was, are you gonna invest in my company? Um, can you find more investors and uh, can you advise? Can you give any advice? Can you help with this, that? So those three questions kind of forged a path for me because the, can you invest is a pretty straightforward. You like the project, you have the funds, yes or no. Uh, and then can you help me find more capital? That was the tricky part because I wasn't really well connected when I first started investing in the angel uh, world. Uh, I wasn't really connected into any big networks or, or wealthy circles. So uh, I, I always thought it would be interesting to be able to um, open it up to more people not just accredited investors, but open it up to more people. And when Obama administration started working on Jobs Act, um, I got an opportunity to contribute to those uh, discussions and conversations. So it became very, uh, the Job Act of uh, 2012. And then as a result of that, we got the uh, Regulation A+, plus, which was an extension on Reg A, which, uh, Regulation A, which was uh, really not an exemption a lot of people could use because it was very onerous, uh, you know, state by state, the blue sky, yeah. and it, it wasn't practical for small businesses. You needed a serious accounting and legal team to be able to comply with those requirements. It's all, it was almost on par with doing an IPO. So when they introduced Reg A Plus, now it opened it up to um, a lot of people who weren't qualified investors in the U.S. to be able to participate in private offerings. And that kind of answered that second question, hey, can you find us more money? I'm like, now I can, because now you can uh, energize your friends and family and mm -hmm. you know your network into the race too. And um, met my partner at that time, and we just started a marketing agency that just uh, focused on getting these uh, uh, campaigns out to let people know that there are these opportunities that they can invest in. And we did probably three of the first five reggae plus uh, offerings. The marketing and and uh, you know promotion for it did really well, and. Um, yeah. So then, me, uh, what, what, what do you attribute that success to? You're in a new field. Sure, you finally earned it. But why specifically were yours successful? 
right time, right place with the right experience. Okay. I mean, I had owned a PR agency before that, so I knew how to do uh, PR type of marketing. My business partner had done influencer marketing and event marketing. So we understood the uh, winning elements of marketing. And then when this thing first launched, there were no other agencies doing anything like this. So we went to the top campaigns and told them we can do this. This is how you energize a, a large community, large public behind your race. And, you know, it all came together. I mean, I, I always right. uh, give a lot of credit to the time timing of it and, and, of course, the luck. Because without those two elements, you can be the best at something and it's not your time you're not gonna have that explosive uh growth yep well luck, luck is a skill also um so here we are in 2024 are you, are you still in touch with the reggae plus world and how, how do you looking back now over a decade of this legislation how, would you say it fulfilled its goal did it come up short did it show up differently than you expected it evolved in the right direction i can tell you that um, so between Reggae Plus becoming law and um, the ICOs going crazy 2016, mm -hmm. I think it was very promising, although very limited to the U.S. market and not global. Uh, I thought it did a fairly good job at opening early stage deals um, to, to everyday investors. So I... I think it was a success. Was it a success 100%? Did it reach everyone's you know, dream level of um, making democratizing investment in early stage deals? No, because the original form of uh, Reggae Plus was still very expensive and, and very limited. Then they introduced regulation crowdfunding, Reg CF, and kind of made it easier and reduced the barriers, the cost of entry to that space. Then they expanded the regulation crowdfunding to from 1 million maximum to five. Mm -hmm. So I think today, if you are a small business in US with a strong community, it is a very viable tool to use instead of going to VC funds or hedge funds and you know seeking large investments, you can, really energize, activate your community and um, and raise funds, raise the funds you need because 5 million is the sizable, respectful, you know. You can do uh, that. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so I think I think it's going in the right direction. There are still a little bit of, um, you know, areas of improvement that can be worked on. But the speed at which it evolved is very promising because if you know any U.S. legislation, it usually doesn't change in eight, 10 years. It takes several cycles, political cycles for anything to get done. And this this is uh, this is of value and interest to everyone. And I think they're uh, tweaking it and improving it as, as needed. That's great. Now, you, you actually provided a good bridge for where I want to go next, which is you and I knew each other in 2016, 17, 18, when these ICOs were happening. And I, I personally had the, the wish or the dream or the expectation, and maybe you did also, that these ICOs would take step in and we're, we're trying to be the blockchain version of regulation fundraising or the Indiegogo or whatever, whatever the, these things were, where a community bootstraps a project and the token economics are self-sustaining and rather than doing it through the sort of resistant, molasses, like slow raising in a traditional manner, we'd have crowdfunding on fire. I, th I think that was a dream of the early ICOs. And I think that dream un unfortunately is over now because uh, regulation is fully extended. And I think ICOs are sort of dead. So that, that fun time in the late 2010s maybe passed us by, though it was great when it happened. It just what's your perspective on that? I don't I don't think they're dead. I think um so so my introduction to ICOs was 2016 when I was talking to a friend of mine from abroad and uh, they were launching an ICO for their platform. And they asked me, can you help us with the fundraise? With your track record and experience, you would be a very valuable partner in this. 
And I, I said, let me let me investigate. Let me figure out what this is so I can tell you if my skill set and experience is transferable or if this is completely different. And then, you know, our claim to fame was, you know, raising, uh, I don't know, we had indications of interest for $47 million. And then we ended up raising, I think, close to 18. I mean, that was a record in the U.S. from a crowdfunding campaign at that time. That's great. And then I looked, I looked at ICOs and there was this one Chinese ICO that raised 20 plus million in um, about five seconds. Mm-hmm. And I looked at it and I looked at my nine month journey raising 17, 18 million. I said, that is the future. That's you're, what you're, you're in the wrong game. Yes. Yes. I, 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 I felt humbled to know that uh, money can move a lot faster. That started the the journey with the ICOs. And I think because of the technical um, nature where if you cannot figure out how, to, how at those days, how to participate in an ICO, then you weren't welcome. No one said, oh, we're gonna make it super easy. And the global nature of it, they are a far superior method. Um, now that yes. the technical, the technical part is um, very simplified. There are graphical user interfaces. There are platforms that help you with your initial launch. Uh, I think it's it has become mainstream uh, outside of U.S. In the U.S., I don't really see why we couldn't make some tweaks to the Jobs Act to welcome ICOs. Uh, with open arms. Obviously, the political appetite has to be there. So I wouldn't say they're completely uh, out of question and, you know, never going to happen. It's uh, it's not compatible with what we have. On the contrary, the legal structure is there. As soon as there is uh, some recognition, and that's that's also starting with uh, the Dow legislation in Wyoming that just uh, passed, because um, you know, when, when we started our, our last uh, journey with Equify, everyone was saying, well, you, you're you saying you're DeFi, but you're centralized. And and I tried to explain to everyone, well, you can't get a banking license as a decentralized organization because there is no framework for a decentralized organization to be recognized legally anywhere in the world. That has changed in the That's last changed. two years, which it's is- here in Dubai. Yes, which is fascinating because now you can have a DAO that's legally recognized as an entity that doesn't pull in every member or token holder as liable, you know, liable parties. And, and that kind of change, the same thing can happen to crowdfunding in U.S. All they need to say is, you know, we recognize these tokens as, as a way to transact and raise funds not trying to make it a security, not a security, you know, yes. don't go into 1940s uh, discussion of what's a security, come to 21st century and look at it like, okay, you can do your reg CF with tokens and this is how it needs to work. I don't think that's a lot of work from a legal perspective to define that framework and ICOs will be back. Uh, you, you know, th- this is supposed to be a, 20, 30 minute interview, but of course, now that we're talking, I, I want to get into it. So, it, you know, say, what, what's neat about Dubai, and maybe you can comment about this. What, what I think is neat about Dubai is even though it's, you know, the Dubai is not the UAE, UAE is the nation. Dubai is just an emirate, but it has its own crypto regulator, VARA, Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority. And as far as I know, it's the first regulator that was created and exists solely to regul- regulate tokens or, or crypto or virtual assets. And so in the case of Dubai, at least, they seem to have jettisoned this securities commodities debate that was fascinating yet time-wasting for everything. And then just if it's a token or if it's a virtual asset, it's under VARA and these rules apply. So they don't bother with their own little version of the Howey test or you know fighting it out between regulators. And I, 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 think, I, th- I think that is going to be the future in jurisdictions that are more nimble. I always thought it was strange that in the US, the SEC and the uh, CFTC were separated. It seemed like it, it they, they rushed through during the Great Depression and World War II and they just had to get stuff done. Other, other countries have like one omnibus financial regulator. I think you either need that or you need a, a separate 
crypto regulator because it is such a unique space. But now that we have it, you know, DAOs are possible. Is it, yes. that, that was a statement that's also a question because you can give me your thoughts on that. Well, I, I mean, I think it was a statement, but yes, I, I agree. It, I it think... was a statement, but I, I, I invoke your wisdom. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I I think it's um, it's very difficult to take any established um, and older framework and apply it to technology that moves faster. Yes. So the the speed the, the speed at which transactions happen in the 30s and 40s was uh, paper. You actually signed little papers, pieces of paper on the trading floor and gave it to each other. And that represented a trade. Um, and, and if you look at trades now, you don't even know your counterparty. It's automated market making, decentralized exchanges, instant 24 seven. So I think having a completely separate regulator for virtual and digital assets is, is, is the right step forward just because the know-how and the experience needed to regulate virtual assets or digital assets is very different from paper assets with paper certificates of ownership and, and, and things like that. And unfortunately, this um, not letting go of certain powers or trying to extend your kingdom uh, scenario in in U.S. from regulators is creating a lot of friction for you know everyday business folk that that are trying to build. Uh, you know when SEC and CFTC are fighting over who's going to regulate what, um, it's it's not conducive to good business and and it creates this hostile environment where you know it's legislature. By, by lawsuits and, and yep. it's it's not good. Whereas if you look at the approach in UAE, uh, in Dubai, it's a standalone um, entity that's just focused and has the expertise, has accumulated and, and welcome the experience of industry leaders to, to regulate the industry. And, and so when you look at VARA or, or, or um, you know, there are a couple other countries that have similar uh, government bodies that are just focused on digital assets. And you look at SEC, they just don't have the capability to regulate digital assets, but they're trying to do it. And the results are out there. It's, 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 it's sad. I mean, I, I don't want to go into that, but uh, you know, what we see in US is just, it's it's not working and you look at uae uh and and the the amount of uh brain trust they've accumulated and and the value proposition there it's incredible because everyone started at the same time this is not like oil or gold where you have it or you don't have it you have an advantage no in 2009 everyone learned that there was bitcoin and in 2016, 17, everyone learned that you could do something called initial coin offering. And the amount of time, it, the amount of time each government had to react to that reality is exactly the same. And look at where UAE is and look at where US is or some other, I mean, even in Europe, which I would put somewhere between UAE and US uh, with the new regulations coming, they're, they're struggling because they still have one foot in the olden days where, you know, there were certain definitions and expectations. And they are trying to have a separate team looking at the digital assets and understanding them. But it's it's a tough journey when you do it that way, whereas the separation really allows you to focus and get the right, right uh, legislature in place. There's, there's a lot of good comments and observations there. We, and this leads us, I think, naturally into Equify. Equify? Equify. Say it correctly for me. Equify. Equify. Thank you. You know, which is, explain that platform. And of course, you know, you can talk about the regulatory aspect, but also what you're offering and what the genesis was and wh where it's going. Well, um, Equify is, um, is the brainchild of... Uh, Jason Blick, who's my partner, and, and me, 
Um, in 2019, when DeFi was um, picking up and going, we sat down and said, let's do something in the DeFi space because um, he has a banking background. Mm -hmm. I'm an economist by training. DeFi technology seemed really a natural progression of where uh, we could go. And, and uh, we looked at it and there were a lot of uh, really interesting DeFi projects growing and, and the, um, the industry was growing. And we didn't really want to compete with any of those. We, we looked at the market, looked at the industry, said, what is missing? What can we provide that's going to benefit everyone? Not just us, not just our community, but everyone in the space. And uh, banking came to mind. Digital okay. asset companies and blockchain companies and crypto companies are unbanked or underbanked by design. The traditional banking industry and finance industry has done pretty much everything they can to shut this industry out of the traditional rails. Uh, so we thought if we could create a banking environment that's uh, welcoming to digital asset owners, producers, traders, and, and just people in, in the blockchain industry, that would serve the whole entire industry. And that's what we did. And again, at that time, there was no way of doing a completely uh, decentralized bank. And we understood that. So we positioned Equify as a transition. Here we are where everything is centralized and decentralization is being vilified by the incumbents. And here's the future where I believe everything is going to be decentralized and we're going to be, hopefully most of our businesses are be, be going to be governed by DAOs and programmatically. How do we usher the era from here to there with a project? And that's Equify. I mean, Equify is the bridge between traditional banking and, and the future of finance. I'm not even going to call it banking anymore. And so we started working on it in 2020 uh, summer on the white paper. And uh, towards the end of the year, we started uh, building the technology. We did a small race in uh, 2021, in March, uh, which went uh, unexpectedly well. Uh, and we went live um, August 7th of 2021 with our platform, equify.com. And uh, the goal, the purpose was to bring banking and DeFi together. So we have bank accounts, we have cards where you can use in real life. And then you have a yield aggregator that returns you uh, some yield, peer-to-peer uh, -peer loans and traditional loans. We have an OTC desk that allows you to go in and out of uh, any fiat pair or uh, digital asset and fiat pair. Well, not any, the top, most, uh, most liquid, most common ones. But uh, so we wanted to create this one-stop platform where you can go you can have your AED, you can have your US dollars, you can have your Bitcoin, you can have your Ethereum and easily exchange between whatever you need currently in, you know, whatever you have in reserve and be able to access it anywhere in the world. And so, so is this a, I forget the word, Equify, you're, you're, it sounds like you're, you're not, you're, let me make sure I'm understanding this, you're, you're, you're not a bank to DeFi projects, it sounds like, it sounds like you're a bank to users of DeFi, is that is that accurate? Uh, we're a bank to everyone. The projects, the exchanges, the stable coins, the users, traders. So how, how, do, how do you form a relationship? Given that a DeFi project is decentralized, how do you form a relationship with a DeFi project? Well, say. DeFi project has people working for it and those people sometimes cannot uh, spend crypto. They need to spend fiat. They need bank accounts. Just because you're a part of a DeFi project does not mean your uh, landlord allows you to pay him with Bitcoin or you know, your, you can pay your electricity bill with uh, crypto or your server costs with crypto. I mean, just because you're decentralized doesn't mean everything in your project is decentralized. Maybe in five years we'll get there, but today you still have fiat costs that you need to pay uh, either with a card or, or a bank transfer. And so that's where we come in and that's where we can uh, facilitate and automate a lot of those things for a DeFi platform. Then, of course, the users, the participants can also have their own accounts because, again, 
last I checked, there aren't a lot of supermarkets that allow you to buy food with crypto yet. Yeah. And if, if well, they Dubai, do, sort of. the well, the fees are quite high. So yeah. yes, if you want to, you know, if you want to do that, that's an option. But yeah, I agree. I understand. So what, what are your, you, you dropped a couple of good things in there, which is you're, you're servicing the DeFi industry, if you like, and you're on the way to becoming decentralized yourself. You're, if I heard you correctly, you think banking, the word bank is a little bit of a misnomer because it's all going to move to smart contracts and so, all these services can become so atomized that you can't really say there's like a banking sector anymore. There's just sort of financial primitives or what, what do you mean exactly? Um, I, I think the functions of a bank mm -hmm. are going to be embedded in other elements of our life. So the banking okay. sector will be there. Um, the reason why banking sector is one of the heaviest regulated is you're dealing with the value other people created in their lives and you're entrusted with safekeeping it. So, so we're fully licensed regulated and, and we're not gonna be able to uh, go decentralized until we can be fully licensed and regulated in a decentralized manner. That, yes. that requires a lot of mentality change and a lot of innovation from a legal perspective, not from a technology, technology is there. So um, what's happening is you see certain functionalities that maybe 40 years ago that were only offered by your bank coming into other aspects of your life. Um, you know, like uh, neobanks, like uh, brokerages offering you checking accounts and cards. I mean, if you look at how the evolution of plastic cards, whether credit or debit, uh, they were exclusively with banks at one point. After diners, it, it became uh, a product that was offered by banks because they had the information about you to be able to issue those. Mm -hmm. Now you see, you know, Amazon offering cards and, and uh, Apple offering cards and, and things like that. Like your um, technology provider is now going into financial services. And that's with last generation's technology. That's not blockchain. None of those uh, two entities are using blockchain. So using blockchain and having a more decentralized approach, now you can have, for example, your um, AI platform offer you banking services. What would that look like? You can, you can have- uh, It's actually scary, but also very useful. I think but no, like you can have a chat GPT like of interface, and I can tell uh, my uh, my AI companion I want to send a hundred dirhams to Gordon, mm -hmm. and then you receive it. I don't know where you received it because only the platform knows what your target wallet, bank account, card, whatever that is, is set it up on your end, and it's not visible to me. And you don't know what I'm sending. I could be sending Ethereum, Bitcoin, US dollars, AED, but the platform knows that you have an account and I have an account. And I'm just saying, I want to send 100 dirhams worth of value to Gordon and you receive it. And this is a chat. I'm not entering any bank account information. I'm not doing any of that. Or, you know, you want a loan and you say, give me options for a five-year term loan to buy property and then it goes and talks to all the lenders shares with your with them your as much as it knows and then they send you the offers again like just chatting with a with with you know you're saying write this for me oh by the way can you send fifty dollars to my mom or send flowers or something like that so we're working on a that level of integration for our next uh, level of uh, banking services. But that's going to be, that's not going to be a bank. That's going to be a company like OpenAI or, or Microsoft or Google or, uh, you know, you name it. One of the large um, AI companies that's providing that service in partnership with a bank like Equify, Equibank, you know, and, and, and uh, allowing us to plug in our products and services into, into the chat box. Um, and is when you do that- Is it a language model or 
what what is it exactly? Like what's, Sorry, what's, you... what's the what's the mechanism that allows it to, to do that? Because it, it sounds great. It's just an integration with the uh, the data sets that the large language model has access to, and teaching it how to use it. Okay. It, it sounds like heaven, you know, not not having to log into the website, but just chatting with my financial bot, you know, managing my yeah. accounting. Company. Not worrying about wallet addresses, not worrying about bank account numbers, routing numbers. Everything is done on the back 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 end and completely KYC AML. Everything is built in. Um, I think that's going to be the future of regulated financial services and banking. And at that juncture, you don't need brick and mortar banks to do anything. You, you don't need a global bank to do anything because the AI is going to know how to route the value across blockchains, across traditional systems, across whatever is available to it. And is this part of Equify or is this another project? Um, this is going to be a part of Eki. It's going to be um, implemented into uh, Eki Bank and Equify. Uh, now, if the technology itself has a different name, we haven't discussed it yet. You know, that's uh, that hasn't been decided. But uh, the the implementation and availability is going to be to all Eki. And maybe that's something I missed before. So is there like a parent company underneath there? So there's Equify and Eka Bank, or is it like one mass program or project? How are you structured? Or what are your verticals? Um, yeah, we're we're uh, part, we're part of the same ecosystem. There is a holding company that holds everything. Yes. Got it. Okay, so you're, but you're interesting. This is a great project. I, I love I, I love the idea of a AI banking companion that just lets you transmit value and handles all the middle stuff um and and gordon i'm not i'm not uh discrediting the incumbents i'm sure they're also working on their implementation of a easier version of all the services they offer the the challenge there is going to be are they going to embrace technology at a level we do and open their um, transaction rails to blockchain options too? Or are they going to say we're a part of Swift and we're a part of IBAN and we can only use those even with the, you know, with the chat bot or the AI bot, just because uh, the other stuff we're, we're not familiar with and we don't want to use. Our approach is, you know, we want to use the best technology that gets you what you need with the least amount of fees. Their approach may be different, like more of a walled garden approach where these are the pieces we have. But still, I I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the larger global banks started uh, you know, looking into that. Interesting, okay. Well, there's a lot to cover here. I think, obviously we could do another interview, but you, I think I, I wanna end on, you, you seem to be showing increased interest in Dubai visiting more often and, you know, exploring things here. Can you explain that evolution or what, what you're seeing? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I had very close friends in Dubai for, uh, I mean, three decades now. So uh, I've, I've uh, always um, enjoyed, because of my relationships, visiting Dubai. And in the last uh, five years, 10 years, have seen an incredible... Uh, evolution where, um, you know, it's more and more welcoming as if, it, if sure. it's possible because it was a very welcoming country to begin with. And and the, the leadership uh, embracing technology like nowhere else in the world. And as a, uh, as a lover of technology myself, it's, it's, uh, it's, it represents what I believe in, like building a better future for for ourselves and for our kids and uh, for 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 the world uh, through innovation. And and I think uh, we're going to spend a lot more time in Dubai uh, starting this uh, this year, just just because the environment is is uh, what what we need, you know, as a, as a family, as a business. Um, you always when you're on the bleeding edge where the regulation has not uh, quite caught up with technology and, and the business models and things like that. You're, you're always, uh, you know, 
uh, experiencing those challenges where you want to do something and you want to do it right and you want to do it um, within the framework, uh, legal framework available to you. And, um, you know, some jurisdictions are expanding that framework. They're like, if it was here, now it's here. Now, you know, they're like making it so that you can innovate in other places are either keeping to the little box they had or shrinking it in some instances. Yes. And, you know, we want to grow. We want to do bigger and better things globally. And it, it looks like Dubai is uh, the place to be for uh, a strong global presence. And, you know, we're going to pursue that. Well, you're a good man. I've known it a long time and it, warm, it warms my heart that you and your tribe will be here more often and, do more things here. I think I think this environment will benefit from you. It's not just you benefiting from it, but I think someone with your experience and sort of measured approach. You're you have a very entrepreneurial yet measured approach to, to things, you know, which is something that, that I think Dubai will benefit from and will go go very far here. So I'm rolling to the extent I can. I'm rolling out the red carpet, which means you have to play. Thank you, far. thank you, Gordon. You're too kind. Very good. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up for now. We can obviously talk more, but you know. We'll do that in another episode. So thank you, Brad. And hopefully you'll come back on the show. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.